So I thank you. You sent me that literature, you know, that you had uh, written on, uh, you know, on the USAP, you call it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's, that's an interesting concept that I think ought to be discussed more. I always have, but right. it's, uh, but boy, you have covered the lot. Hello. Welcome very much to Conversations, where I'm pleased to welcome to the program Ward Morehouse, and he's the uh, president of the Council on um, International Affairs and, uh, uh, what is it again? I can't see this. International and Public Affairs. That's it, International and Public Affairs. And uh, Ward Morehouse, welcome very, very much to Conversations. Great right. pleasure to welcome you here. Thank in you. This, very glad to be here. In this Christmas season of 1996. I wonder, I always find, we want to talk about the Consul and about the state of world and national affairs and so forth, but I wonder maybe you could. It seems good if you could ground this uh, a little bit in your own background, what your own background was, and then we could, I know you cover a wide variety of subject area in terms of what you keep track of, but could you share a little of your own background and then we could talk about the Council and mm -hmm. world affairs, as it were, from of that course. perspective. Uh, I begin with my point of origin. I'm an unreconstructed Middle Westerner. Oh, right. Uh, I was raised in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Uh, came east for my schooling, not because you couldn't get a quality education in Wisconsin, you surely could. <coughs> the University of Wisconsin, with which my grandfather was associated at the turn of the century, is, mm -hmm. a, is, is a great state university. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, then I went into academic work, uh, taught political science for a while, many, many years ago at uh, New York University, uh, and uh, then fell from grace from a professor's point of view, at least, by becoming an academic administrator. Uh -huh. And I mm -hmm. uh, created and ran for a number of years uh, a center for international studies for the entire s higher education system in, uh, in New York. Wow, that's uh, a big uh, responsibility. Well, it was uh, challenging at the yeah. beginning, yeah. but uh, eventually I got uh, wearied of, of uh, dealing with uh, with the uh, university professors that have a guild mentality, I'm sorry to say, many of them do, yeah. not all, and you put uh, two of them together in the same room and you usually have created another guild. There's an awful lot of politics and things that get in the way of yeah. academic and research, doesn't yeah, it? It, it certainly seems, does. And academia, yeah. it seems. And uh, so I finally decided that um, I want to do other things with my life. Uh -huh. And so in the mid-70s, uh, after a stint of teaching at the University of Lund in Sweden, where I was a visiting professor in, a, in a research policy, uh, science and technology policy studies, we usually call it in this country, uh, I uh, left uh, the academy. I consider myself a self-exile and uh, joined a small research education and advocacy group that works on a range of economic, social, environmental issues uh, <coughs> called the Council on International and Public Affairs. Mm -hmm. And I have been with them ever since. So that would be in the 70s then that, that you joined That was in the mid-70s, that. so uh -huh. about uh, 20 years back. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, you, and you've always had an interest in international affairs. And oh, very much so. Yeah, okay. Very much so. Uh -huh. uh, an important uh, chapter of my life was spent uh, living and working in India in the 1960s. Uh, and I have uh, gone back there virtually every year, sometimes several times a year since. Oh, really? Active engagement in a, with a range of some quite extraordinary human beings. Uh, in the so-called voluntary sector in India, which is very rich and very vibrant. We have a lot to learn from, from uh, some of the real pioneers there in the struggle for economic and social justice. Oh, that's encouraging. We can talk about that. We can huh? talk about that because uh, <coughs> that's, an, that's an important thing. Also, the voluntary sector of the society, world society or national world society, is something that is, I think, I hope, I would hope, is going to become more and more important than perhaps it traditionally has and so forth. I wonder if I could ask you something, international affairs. If one were to say they were in psychology or in psychiatry or if they were in economics, then you could follow up in a certain sense and say, well, are you a Skinnerian? Are you a uh, follower of Carl Rogers? You know, there's many different schools within psychology or are you a monetarist or are you a Keynesian or what in economics? In the world, in the view of international, e international affairs, a broad mm -hmm. systems, it seems almost by definition, approach to understanding the human condition, are, were there major, major um, um, 
writers or major people who in a sort of quasi or mentor kind of way that you had particular interest in in terms of their systems understanding of understanding international relations or are there varieties of interpreting international mm -hmm. relations that stand out one from the other within the field itself of international relations? Well, it certainly is the latter. That is to say, a variety of, uh, of positions, even one might also say ideologies. Yes, uh, all right, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I feel fairly well removed from that arena uh -huh. uh, at this stage. Uh, part of the problem with the academic study of international relations, in my view, is that it uh, has uh, gone the way of, uh, of mainstream economics, which is, uh, in my view is also equally flawed, mm. by becoming overly preoccupied with quantification. Yes, my lord. Yes. And if you couldn't, I mean, I once heard a, 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 a very uh, well-established, well-recognized uh, social scientist say, if you couldn't measure it, it wasn't significant. Oh, dear. Well, well that's, of course, preposterous. That's, that's an extreme uh, position. Yeah, right, right. But uh, right. nonetheless, that's an indication of, of the direction which uh, a lot of the academic study of international relations has gone. It's reduced to, to model building. And, and we all know that the trouble with models as, uh, as replications of reality is that they rest uh, on a whole host of assumptions that uh, are uh, simply don't obtain in the real world. Uh -huh, I mean, it's uh -huh. like the so-called law of comparative uh, economic advantage, yes. which is the underlying rationale for the so-called so free trade movement. Yes, right. Which, of course, isn't free at all. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> there's no such thing as free trade. Okay. Uh, trade is always managed in somebody's interest. Yeah. But the 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 the, the, the fatal uh, flaw in that line of reasoning. Is to not to, is not to re, is not to recognize what Ricardo, hmm. who's regarded as, as the, A the, giant. The, the father of that particular concept, yeah. said this only works uh, if you have uh, uh, perfect competition, which of course doesn't exist anywhere in the uh -huh. world, uh, and you have uh, immobility of capital, uh -huh. uh, and nothing could be less true of today's world than to call capital immobile. I mean, as we all know it moves around the globe uh, at a nanosecond. Uh, trillion dollars tri a day. Trillion dollars a day. Yeah, right, uh, right. Who, who, I mean, it's, so the whole, the, whole, the whole rationale falls on its face because the, because the assumptions don't obtain. Yeah, uh, but that's what I was wondering in a certain sense. I, I, if you think in terms of internet, you think of Re Reinhold Niebuhr, or you think of Hans Morgenthal, or some of the people, and you, and you think also of the concept of realpolitik. There were many people, I think Reinhold Niebuhr was a moral, List in a certain sense. He was concerned with ethics, but there was a book I think he wrote at one time, or it was maybe Hans Morgenthal, Moral Nation, Immoral World, mm -hmm. and they would make a point that in the international order there is no normal ethics or morality that we tend to think of in terms of individual sovereign entities which themselves do have a, a, a social cohesion based upon a certain agreed standard. You get into the international world and it's just nothing but the pure national interest, and they used to take almost in the light in arguing realpolitik and mm. so forth. Do you think we went overboard that way, I mean, in terms of that, or well, how do you, well, how do you see I, that question? I, my take is, uh, is uh, somewhat different. Okay. Uh, I think okay. that what we've, what we've seen in the last uh, half century is a really quite extraordinary transformation of the international system. Uh, Fifty years ago, at the end of the Second World War, yeah. uh, the system was essentially dominated by a handful of nation states. Uh, the victors of the Second World the War. Victors of the Second World War, yeah. of which um, the, the, the most powerful by far was the United States. Sure. Today, uh, we have an international order in which increasingly uh, the more powerful actors are not states at all. That's They're corporations. Right. Yeah. The, uh, the hundred largest corporations in the world today are larger than most of the member states of the United Nations. Could we say that again? The hundred largest These corporations are larger in terms of their gross income right. is greater than the gross domestic product of over half the member states of the United Nations. Okay. So, I mean, uh, General right. Motors is bigger than Denmark, right. which is one specific example, and General Motors isn't even the largest. 
So we now have uh, these enormously powerful institutions uh, that uh, are uh, at large in the in the biosphere, if you yeah, will, right, okay. at large on the planet, right. and we lack any effective uh, institutional mechanisms for controlling them. I can remember Frank Church used to hold meetings on the, on the in the 70s, I think it was, on the implications of the multinational corporation. I guess that was beginning to emerge. Haven't they always been there, the trading companies, East India trading companies, and the, you know, the other, other attempts, or the British thinking in terms of the empire upon which the sun never set? That was a national entity, but there was a, an economic underpinning to that. Hasn't there always been an element of uh, commercial concern on a global scale, well, or is it just the pace, or has it been quantitative change to where well, there is built up to where there is now a qualitative new kind of condition? Yeah. Or Well, I think uh, this may be a case of... Uh, I uh, hesitate to say history repeating itself because the context today is so different than it was three, four hundred years ago. Uh -huh. But it is, it is certainly a fact that <coughs> the East India Company uh, was a corporation. Yes, right. Uh, uh, but eventually, and, and it increasingly assumed the functions of government uh, in India, and effectively mm -hmm. uh, until the British uh, Raj itself was uh, established uh, uh, as the imperial authority right. uh, under the aegis of the king, mm -hmm. at least uh, symbolically, uh, why this uh, India was run, the whole country, the whole uh, this vast subcontinent mm -hmm. was run as a business. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so to some extent what you say is true. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, we now live in a, in a indisputably smaller world, at least in terms of communication, oh, yeah. uh, than, than existed then. Uh, and we live also in a world in which uh, uh, <coughs> the ability to mobilize capital, uh, the ability to communicate uh, one's concerns, whether it be over a product or an idea, uh, th th that has enormous uh, ripple effect mm -hmm. uh, on societies and on communities and on individuals all over the world. So we now have a situation, in my view, in which uh, uh, we have vast, uh, a vast accretion of power uh, in human affairs uh, in the hands of uh, institutions that are essentially unaccountable, certainly in any meaningful democratic sense, mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> and who now have increasingly eroded the power of the nation state. Yes, yes. And I think that that's a phenomenon that we're, oh, we, we don't yet, we, we don't have the institutional uh, means to deal with this new reality. Uh -huh. uh, and that's what we're struggling, some of us, to try to, to create, if even that sounds very ambitious. Yeah. Uh, you, don't, you don't think there were elements of that in the UN itself, or the attempt at that, and the people who were objecting to the, to the support of the UN were saying, we want to maintain our sovereignty in that traditional sort of parochial view, politically. Well, uh, But yeah. the, 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 the objection to the United Nations as an institution or as a, as a concept was one that was, uh, it was formed after 1945, and there was a great optimism that it would be possible to work out a new oh, system yeah, that right. would involve, you know, a governmental entity that could be on a global scale as the, you, you understand what I'm saying? Oh, yes, very, very, And very, it's a little discour well. discouraging that the sorry state that the UN has been allowed to uh, arrive oh, it at is. now. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a shame. It's a yeah. tragedy for the people of the world. You know, it's, that body, uh, really an institutional network, uh, is uh, not without its flaws, as we all know. Mm -hmm. uh, what institution isn't? And that's yeah. what, uh, but uh, many of those flaws are the direct consequence of the conditions that are placed on what the UN can do or not do by its most powerful members. Yes. Uh, and uh, the UN has no independent personality, certainly not in any any salient political sense. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> it's entirely a creature of the most powerful actors, which means, uh, of course, the five permanent members of the Security Council and uh, some dysfunction there because countries like Japan and, and uh, Germany uh, probably sh uh, should be in that same elect circle uh, on the basis of uh, 
GMP, I suppose, mm -hmm. a rather crude measure. Uh, I'm not sure. Another, I mean, uh, the, the whole question of UN reform is a vast subject. It is, that, yeah. Uh, right. I have some passing awareness of, but it's not been a center of our of our interest. Not that it's not an important question, but no. uh, we're a small organization, and uh, we already have a totally preposterous, unrealistic uh, agenda, and we don't need to add to it. To the the UN, you mean itself? Well, yeah. no, I was referring to our oh our, your our council. Con our council, the council, right, right, right. right. So well, even in that sense, you could see that the UN is, in terms of the, the, the degree of the challenge, in a certain mm -hmm. sense, of this spaceship Earth, and the fact that the technology is moving so quickly, and there's a need of a systems understanding, and there has to be some sort of reining in uh, of uh, just this, you know, who's this f f gentleman at NYU, Corton? He's written the no. book, When Corporations Rule the World. No, he's not at NYU. And, or he's, uh, so he's with a group piece created called the People's Centered Development Forum. Okay, yeah. But it's an interesting book in any oh, case, yeah, and it, yeah. it, it, in a certain sense, is being read by many as the, the world is being now, the, 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 the power to run the world has, in a certain sense, one might say, since we live in a world of sovereign nations, the UN is ineffectual and made so, and made almost, in the eyes of many, almost impotent, except to what the, you know, the Piper's tune will call from Washington and so right. forth. But you have, you have nothing like this, so that the, the power and the, the power to direct the world has passed from political entities to corporate entities. And the mm -hmm. corporation has these uh, incredible um, you know, ability to buy governments and to, and to influence governments and so forth. And it's come into, uh, from a standpoint of somebody who studied these things over the long haul, international relations, and that it must be a pretty sorry state of affairs that you see as you look out at uh, the way this spaceship Earth is being operated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, it is discouraging. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It's uh, it's uh, also sobering uh, to contemplate how long uh, the human community can continue to uh, feed off uh, the biosphere, which all living creatures depend upon for, for life itself. Yeah. Uh, in the destructive way in which we're now doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the, the, unfortunately, the effort to address uh, that sort of central uh, problematique of our age mm -hmm. uh, has been reduced to a, a, a slogan, sustainable development, mm -hmm. which is an oxymoron in my view. Uh, uh, and, okay. and now everybody's appropriated. I mean, uh, someone was reminding me the other day that uh, I think it was at the Rio conference, um, the UN 92. conference on the on the environment yeah. and, uh, in '92, that uh, somebody conjured up a statement on sustainable development, and then got all of the, well, all but a number of the world's leading corporations to sign it and say these are our principles. When these corporations like Exxon. Uh, or my bet noir Union Carbide mm. uh, <coughs> have um, gone around the world destroying whole ecosystems, uh, uh, fouling the atmosphere, uh, poisoning groundwater. Uh, and so the whole the whole concept has become uh, corrupted. So you 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 do not think the uh, the concept itself of sustainable development is in itself a you you call you say it's an oxymoron. In itself, well, because what, I think what what, what, would, what term would you replace it with? I mean, would you? I mean, if I may, I mean, do, do, do you do believe in economic development or bringing up a lot of the masses of the people of the world in material sense, or what? what, what how do you see it? Well, if it's not see, sustainable this is, development, this is, this is what do the, you see? If this you look is one at of the great uh, anomalies of our of our time, isn't yeah. it? Uh, okay. On the one hand, it's very clear, at least uh, to me, that we can't go on as we've been doing uh, indefinitely into the future. Mm -hmm. We're clearly, we're clearly consuming uh, uh, a, a, our, our natural resource base. It's, 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 it's our capital in a sense, uh, and we're, we're, we're drawing down on it uh, uh, <coughs> in, a, in a, apparently in an accelerating fashion. Certainly in a, in a, in a, in a fashion that means that we can't go on this way f uh, for, you know, for the next 500 years or whatever time frame. It might be we're good to get that kind of a perspective once in a while, <coughs> to get a longer perspective. Well, yes. Indigenous people in this country right. have a concept of 
seven, of seven generations. Yes, right. and, um, even that's a, <laughs> we're, we're far from having that as a as a, as a, as a, as a as a as a real time frame in which uh -huh, to, uh -huh. to make choices uh, and that uh, govern our, our activities, but I think it is one of the cruel dilemmas of our time that uh, uh, the rest of the world, uh, uh, outside the industrialized countries, which is what sixty seventy percent of the world's population, uh, if uh, every one of those persons lived the way you and I do then the world really would be uninhabitable. Uh, so what do we do? Now, uh, you know, advocates of, of population control say, well, the problem is we've got too many people. Uh, and uh, where the most people are is in countries like India and China. Uh, so let's get them to, to slow down, if not stop, their population growth. Uh, I've always felt that that was uh, misdirected. The real problem, and this is where we need uh, population control, is in our own societies. I mean, the average American consumes something in the order of a hundred times as much energy as the average Indian does. But that's not a population control. Our populations in the industrialized well, but, countries no, are but it is, it, it, it is. It is. In, I mean, in it, it is in numbers. terms of resource consumption. Oh, all right. Well, that's uh, a so if, if if we're trying to 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 reduce resource consumption. Uh, in the industrialized countries in order to give some space for growth and improvement of, of living standards uh, in, in the third world, mm -hmm. uh, the place to begin is right here at home. So it's uh, important that the people in the industrialized world or the developed world be able to get a sense of conservation and perhaps even a, a little less uh, 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 greed, as it were, well, uh, uh, in, 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 in their consumption in order that others would be able to come, well, be able to have their standards lifted. It surfaces think? mostly in, in alternative circles or folks who are trying to think of alternative kinds of economic and social institutions that uh, are, among other things, uh, more uh, conserving, less injurious to the environment. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, <coughs> uh, it uh, surfaces uh, there in the concept of uh, voluntary simplicity, uh, of uh, trying to live more lightly on the, on, on the land. Uh, the problem with that concept is not the concept itself, but uh, the difficulty of, of uh, apparently persuading millions of, of people in a, in a country like the United States that uh, this indeed is something they should aspire to when they've, they're having their, their demands constantly stimulated by, uh, by the promotion of new goods and services and persuaded that uh, there are things we can't do without. I mean, uh, Advertising and yes, the, yes. the hidden persuaders that Mr. Packard, Vance Packard used to talk about yes, so, yes, so tellingly, you know, yes, that all sort there. of thing. And that, that's what drives it in a certain sense, truth and advertising as yes, they make yes, this thing, yes. that kind of thing. Um, I wonder if it is, that's an important point, is that uh, do you think the world is and ever more must be? Some people will argue uh, that um, in the world of information that uh, they've been able to do, or as Bucky Fuller used to say, God bless him, used to say, that it is possible to have through elegance of design that we've made some progress. Uh, the technology is not only an, a, a device, it's an extension of consciousness. And that it's, it's not just a means that we must rape the planet with <coughs> satanic mills that Blake used to talk about in the Industrial Age, but that we're coming into a time where through elegance of design it is possible to do more with less. Mm. So that you would be able to have development in the, in the sense of the word uh, without raping the planet, as had been the case industrially. Uh, the computer revolution where, I suppose you've been to Bangalore, it's even beginning mm -hmm. to go in, oh, yes. in, in, in India and so forth, Bombay, but where the, the Silicon Revolution, which has been so tremendously able to bring down the cost of information and the, mm. the computer chips are so, so inexpensive now and that it's becoming to where they, they would be able to have people, instead of it being internally a, a zero-sum situation where for one group to win, the other group has to be brought down, it might be possible that there could be development that would not rape 
the environment, if there was an appropriate economic potentiality or economic system that allowed us to realize our full technological capability. So do you understand what I'm saying? So the, the technology could be seen as something that is not an enemy in terms of the green sense of the world and something, but is, is a means by which we might be able to achieve a situation where ecological standards or systems understanding of the biosphere in this universe and so forth could be realized. Is, mm. is, is there any hope in that direction or is that just a sure? Well, uh, <laughs> I used to write books and papers about this subject. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> because my particular stick um, within the realm of political science was, uh, I mentioned science and technology policy studies, mm -hmm. and one dimension of that is trying to gauge uh, uh, the impact of technological change on society uh, and of also trying to, to assess or analyze how technological choices are made, and who makes them and with what consequences. And I think one of the clear lessons to me from that kind of an intellectual exercise, uh, which of course has enormous implications for the day-to-day -day world, it's not, mm -hmm. uh, it's not a, an abstract uh, question. Uh, it's very real and, and goes to the heart of the issue you were raising, is that uh, the control, effective control uh, over uh, technological choice, that is which technologies are developed, which technologies reach the market, uh, with, uh, uh, with what kind of impact, uh, these decisions are effectively made for the most part in corporate boardrooms. Okay. Now, Okay. And they are made in a, in what would have would have to say is a profoundly undemocratic context. What everyone else okay. may, one may say about a corporation, uh, it's uh, it's not a democratic institution. It's a hierarchical institution. Uh, it's uh, by and large not transparent in the way it reaches decisions. Uh, there is uh, there's lip service toward participation, but the reality is in most large corporations certainly that uh, the uh, really critical decisions are made at the top, and you have a reward structure that reflects that. It um, sure does increasingly, doesn't it? Well, I mean, to a degree where it's just becoming uh, obscenely absurd, the well, degree is. of the difference between the guy on the shop floor and the CEO well, in this yes, economy yes. is getting ridiculous. And well, it's As true. they scapegoat the people at the bottom, the welfare people and no, so forth. That's there. right. That's yeah. right. You're absolutely right. Well, that ratio, the ratio of, of the CEO's pay to the average hourly wage earner in a large corporation in the United States has gone from something on the order of 40 to 1 back in the early 80s to over 200 to 1 today. Eat God. Yeah. Uh, my favorite way of uh, illustrating that uh, in terms that I think we can all understand is uh, to observe that Michael Eisner, the head of Walt Disney, mm. made in uh, 1993 uh, $203 million dollars which works out to be $84,000 an hour. Nice work if you can get it. That's good pay. Yeah, that's, that's um, a pretty high rate. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but yes, and so, so that the major part of the economy, ec economic development itself is in the private sector, has been. Uh, we've had an intervention in the, I mean, and so can we, rep can we trust the market system? Or what is our relationship to the market system that they will argue in, 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 the, in, in favor of, uh, we did have a broad brushed critique of market capitalism or in, you know, in, uh, in, in the socialist critique that was grounded in some of the writings of Hegel and Marx and so forth. We had a critique of that, but that seems not to be there as an effective force in the world now. It's unbridled capitalism and there seems not to be an ethical standard by which capitalism can be judged or a, an ideology or a, a way of understanding that can lead toward um, a sense of equity within this. Uh, and do you understand this is a major dilemma and can we trust the market or not or what should be our attitude toward it or should we go toward thinking in terms of governmental intervention into the marketplace and what it can do is tremendously productive what it can realize um, in order in the name of equity or what do you advise I mean in a socialist pattern or well what? It's, it's another one of the great dilemmas of our age isn't it uh, clearly the the um, version of socialism that the Soviet Union uh, practiced uh, both within its own boundaries and the neighboring satellite states uh, didn't work uh, for whatever reasons uh, and 
Well, there are many reasons that are offered, many explanations, and probably there's some truth in, in, in most of them. Uh, and so indeed, we now have a, uh, a, a world in which the driving force uh, for uh, global uh, development is no longer the nation state. Mm -hmm. uh, nation states are getting out of the development business, uh, and increasingly the agents of, of development uh, are trade, not aid. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, still have institutions like the World Bank uh, that uh, perform a, a, a very important function in the creation of a world dominated by corporations, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. they're, in a sense, the advanced party. And their function is to get uh, third world economies opened up so that they're hooked uh, to an international system, economic and political system, in which they're minor players. So in the nature of things, they're going to be exploited. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what the, the answer is, frankly. One thing's clear to me, and that is that, uh, uh, well, the so-called market uh, is useful for some things, it's not useful for all things. Uh, and it's very clear, uh, I mean, we need only look at our own society and yes. look at the, the, along with the obscene concentration of wealth at the top, um, degrading poverty at the bottom. Uh, and in a society as affluent as ours, uh, that uh, that shouldn't be. I mean, it's, well, uh, it is unconscionable. Uh, and so there's something wrong with our system, yes. too. Uh, now, not all of the contradictions have yet surfaced, but uh, give it time. Uh, right, okay. Uh, uh -huh. it's, uh, and some of us are trying to uh, hasten the day when, uh, when those contradictions are... are, are are, are in fact uh, not only recognized but become decisive factors in, in, in human affairs. Yeah, well that, that, that's something, uh, in, I don't know, in a dialectic, you know, even if you were to go to a dialectic understanding, is a thesis, an antithesis, something, or, I mean, how long will that, William Grider, who we both admire very much and so forth, has written and others have. I, and I also would like to mention Lewis Kelso, who I used to talk to often in a mentor kind of way, used to say, he, you know, how long will the people take it in a, in a certain sense, or at what point will the consciousness rise? But people have an un, a, a tremendous <coughs> capability of just in a certain sense accepting what is, rather than, particularly if there's no clear alternative that is able to be presenting itself, they will do almost anything in order to just keep some elemental sense of security they might be able to gain within the way things, the mm. things are. Mm. But if, if it did reach some critical mass, it, it, it then would ultimately, unless you wanted to think in terms of some anarchy or something, you know, it would, it, there would have to be some sort of an alternative sure. to what there is. And, and one wonders about that. And I'm interested in, if I may, in your work, mm -hmm. one of the things you've been interested in, because you, you've, um, you've, 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 you've seen the importance of the, the capitalist system, as it were, in a sense, and have at least looked at and addressed the fact that, uh, as Mr. Cuomo, our ex-governor, uh, notes, he said, the people who are at the top who own all of the technology that's becoming more and more relevant to production are doing very, very well. Sure. And they're tied into the logic of business finance. They make an investment, pays for itself out of its future earnings. They get wealthier and wealthier and wealthier through the operation of the private property system. And the mass of the people have only a job relationship mm -hmm. in order to gain income, never have enough savings in order to get in on the li you know, that growth of the economy right. and right. become involved right. in it. But, and, and that, you know, there, there's a contradiction there and there has been some argument over the longer haul between the socialist critique of the institution of private property itself, whether the means of production should be owned in the private sector. And it seems to be resolved that it is going to be owned by and large in the private sector, but it's all owned by a few people. Right. You have looked, if I'm not mistaken, you've looked, uh, you and Mr. Spicer, Stewart, Stuart Spicer, had right. looked at some of Lewis Kelso's work and others and uh, built upon it in their view. And that is an important question that ought to surface in the consciousness of the American people more than it perhaps has, that there is an alternative way to relate the American or the world citizen, perhaps, to the economic process other than only through jobs or labor distribution of income that we should expand ownership of 
technology or technological systems or capital assets in a democratic way mm -hmm. to, the, to, the, to the citizens of the world in a way that we haven't even, it never comes up in the p normal political dialogue. It's sort of locked into a, a, a labor value theory of uh, human affairs. I don't know, you've addressed that question or looked at it, haven't well, you? Well, oh, very much so. I mean, I think it's uh, anyone who has studied at all the uh, reality of the U.S. labor market, which is one of the uh, colleague and, and I each year for a number of years have produced a little analysis we call the underbelly of the U.S. economy. Yes, it's important, uh, yes. And <coughs> one of the things we do is to look at uh, joblessness and we compare the government figures of official, officially defined unemployment with real joblessness, mm -hmm. joblessness being defined as, uh, as uh, in, in involving anyone who wants a job but can't find one. Uh -huh. And the uh, jobless rate almost invariably runs at least twice, and uh, in recessions more than twice, the official unemployment rate. That's pretty, so that's significant. It certainly is. Yes, it, it certainly, certainly is. is. Uh, <coughs> it certainly is. Uh, so one of the things we know as a consequence uh, of this kind of analysis is the situation is much more serious than, uh, than uh, I think is generally understood, uh, not only in terms of uh, joblessness, but also in terms of, um, of real wages, which uh, I think is now increasingly recognized. When we first started doing this work in the mid-80s, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. That uh, real wages of industrial workers have been dropping. Absolutely. Uh, <coughs> Since about 73, I think, they don't track any longer. Well, uh, the, today, the real, the real uh, uh, average hourly industrial wage today is lower than it was in 1969. Mm -hmm. uh, income is becoming consistently more unequally distributed, so we're now, we're now a nation more unequal than we were, we were before 1950. Mm -hmm. uh, and I could go on, the poverty level is, uh, is also rigged to understate the extent of poverty. And if I may, they have, uh, they have inter, they, uh, currently, and we had Mr. F Roosevelt and other kinds of people who would see the, you know, the ability of the, uh, of the state or the, the governmental, the body, collective body politic to intervene in the name of equity and distribute some income through social programs and welfare programs and other kinds of aid to dependent children, Head Start, other kinds of things. And now the government in power, voted in by the people who voted, have said they're going to cut that out and they're going to t cut people who've been on the welfare and they're going to be cutting people that have been getting some sort of assistance through the government uh, system and they're going to cut that out and just make it ever more in a certain sense, in a certain sense, mean-spirited mm -hmm. and expecting everyone to get a job that is going to be able to r raise their standard of living, and they'll have high, high wage, high wage jobs for everybody, and they say everything is fine. And the, and the current administration is able to win election on that campaign, and uh, that's the situation that we're in. Well, it's illustrative uh, of uh, another myth of our society, but uh, perhaps I should <coughs> dwell just a moment more on this whole issue of, of uh, income uh, distribution right. in our economic system. Uh, because I think what's becoming in, uh, increasingly apparent uh, from these kinds of trends, which I was just speaking, that, uh, and forecasts are even gloomier. I mean, like, yeah. uh, the uh, trends, uh, yeah. I mean, the, uh, <coughs> the um, um, who's our friend from Washington, uh, who's written The End of Work, Oh, that's, uh, uh, yeah, right, Jeremy, Rifkin, Jeremy Rifkin. Jeremy yeah. Rifkin. And Aronowitz here and in Aronowitz New York. Yeah. In New York. Mm -hmm. <coughs> no, uh, some of us have some problem with that analysis, but mm -hmm. uh, nonetheless, there, there, there are elements of truth in it. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> and so for a long time, it seemed to me that we need to find, at least in an industrialized country like the United States, some other mode of income distribution besides wage employment, as it is now. That's for ordinary people, that's the principal means of, principal source of income. Is Absolutely. Through, through wage employment. Well, that and transfer payments. Right. They're going to cut out the transfer payments. You know? So that led me in the, in the early 80s to uh, uh, join forces with, uh, with Stuart Spicer mm -hmm. uh, in trying to promote uh, 
more widespread analysis and debate on different ideas, different approaches that would address this fundamental uh, uh, anomaly of, 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 of our kind of economic system. Mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, approach that uh, Stuart favored uh, was what uh, we used to call universal capitalism or uh, sometimes uh, USOP plans, universal stock ownership plans, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. modeled in a sense uh, after ESOPs, which of course Lewis Kelso, Kelso was a primary promoter of, yeah. employee stock ownership plans. Mm -hmm. uh, I must say that, that uh, reflecting on uh, these ideas, we ran a number of essay contests to try to stimulate people to, to think about these issues and to come up with alternative ideas. We published uh, several books on the subject uh, that uh, one of the critical issues that few of those who participated in this uh, sort of dialectical process that we tried to stimulate addressed, uh, and I think it was a, it was a shortcoming of those of us who, who were instigators in a way of this effort as well, was to recognize that ownership and control are two different propositions. Yes, they are. You could have and ownership as a means of income distribution without control. And you know. then you were, but then you run into the anomaly, and this will bring me back to the yeah. issue you just raised, which I characterized as a myth, of, mm -hmm. about which most Americans have about, or many of them, I shouldn't say most, because I really don't know that, but many of us do about our own society, that it's a political democracy. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, and uh, it's, it's not, in my view. And I think this point can be very simply illustrated. Uh, uh, I don't have the precise numbers from the last election, but actually would make the case even more strongly. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, what we live in is a plutocracy that is governed by the top 20% of the population in terms of income. Oh, uh, I don't think there's any doubt on that. Certainly. Certainly, we live in an economic plutocracy. Well, and I say I and would argue that political follow, probably follows into politics. Usually, yes. the politics and the economics track, they, don't they? They, they do. Uh -huh. I would argue that it applies also to the to the political system. Uh -huh. uh, and um, make the case of the very simple analysis. So there are two factors that produce this result. One is the low level of participation in the electoral process, which yeah. has reached a new low now. In the yeah, it was an all-time low, right? In the election. Yeah. Uh, and the other is the correlation between income and electoral participation, which is almost directly inverse. Mm -hmm. That is, say, one out of five poor people vote, four, four out of five rich people vote, more mm -hmm. or less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The result of these two factors is that the population, uh, the, the, the outcome of a national election is determined by 20, 25 percent of the voting age population. I mean, even Reagan's landslide, so-called, he got no more than 32, 33 percent of the support of the voting age population. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, most presidents in modern times, uh, at least since the Second World War, have, uh, have had to do with 25, 28, 30 uh, percent. And I would guess that Clinton is down to 20 percent of the voting age population. So we live, in a voted for him. we live in a plutocracy. So and some, people, some people have even s referred to it as a, as a sort of post-industrial feudalism that we're coming into. And I mean, you know, that, that sort of thing. And, the, and the, the, the autonomy of the individual person, much less the sense of security of the individual person, economically or otherwise, is being eroded and cut out from under them. And in those conditions, psychologically, they naturally focus on trying to do something to get their economic house in order, as it were, the government and the systems that be put the blame on them, and they say, if you're not making it, it's your own fault, and that right. sort of thing. And they undercut the possibility of there being a political intervention into the mean-streeted capitalist world, where the tremendous advantages of the 20 percent, and the, the, the incursions, as it were, into the marketplace in the name of equity has been done against, historically, against a base where the institution of private property, the individual private property ownership, was the villain, in a certain right. sense, in the minds of many people who are, let's say, leftist, let's say. Mm -hmm. And they would try and tax those who are very wealthy and distributed in the name of equity. And they would, they would attack the institution of private property. 
Here we're asking people to consider, instead of attacking the institution of private property and looking long term, is you've got to democratize private property ownership as a way of distributing income, which would make sense if the technology is becoming increasingly relevant in terms of the overall productive capability of the system. They have robotic run systems where the people, the labor contribution is less and less relevant, right. but the people are not related to the economy the way the goods are being produced, you no, know? No. So there's something askew, mm. and you were one who was concerned for the less advantaged, but you were not necessarily, you, 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 but you were also able to see that it might be good to democratize the ownership of that capital, mm. those capital assets uh, in, an, in an overall sense. That don't you think many of the people who are concerned have, uh, with the, the plight of the society as a whole, have in a certain sense just been blinkered by yeah. this traditional thinking that private property ownership is and of itself a wrong concept and we ought not to try and go down that course. We should tax those people and distribute it through governmental processes. And that seems not to be working in the body, no. in the system that we have now. <coughs> no. And yet and that might be the central the question is, that has to be addressed. Yeah, but the key, I think, is, uh, is politics. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, and that, that has everything to do with, with control. Uh, okay. That's what the study of politics is about, uh, the role of power in, in human, human affairs. Yes. And that, I think, is the, I mean, I think there's a recognition uh, by people like Stuart Spicer and, and others. And we had a modest movement then, and there still are people who are concerned, many of them, and since the issues have become more pressing with the passage of time, uh, recognize that uh, transfer payments, which was the other classic mode of income distribution right. in industrialized society, were running into increasingly heavy political weather right. because of this plutocracy political structure in which we live. And so this was an attempt, in a sense, to do an end run around that, uh, to try to create a situation in which, uh, uh, <coughs> as people acquired an increasingly more significant uh, ownership of productive assets, mm -hmm. that uh, it would, the income from those assets would provide an increasingly larger share of, uh, of their income. Right. It would be less dependent on wage uh, employment. Right. Uh, and, uh, uh, but that, in my view, founders on, on this uh, political anomaly that we've, of which we've been speaking, mm -hmm. uh, and that as long as political control is effectively in the hands of a small minority at the top, and actually it's not even 20 percent that define oh, the choices yeah. we get, it's what, one half of one percent? Yeah, right. Like they, well, one half of one percent, I think, is up 43, 44 percent of all total assets now. So uh, we can't divorce the two. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is one of the lessons I learned from, from uh, that effort in the, in the early and the mid-80s, uh, which was, I think still served a useful function because it began to open out debate on, on some of these kinds of issues. But I've now moved in, in terms of the, the work that we do that mm -hmm. uh, engages my most active attention, uh, much more toward a, a, an analysis that seeks to confront this political reality uh, and to try to do what one can to learn from uh, the lessons of the past uh, and the last time we had a really serious populist political movement in this country was 100 years ago, with the populist movement, as mm -hmm. it's usually called by historians. Now, there were many failings to that. It was, uh, it was not all milk and honey by any manner of means, uh, but it at least represented an articulation of class interest. Uh, another myth we have about ourselves, we live in a classless society, everybody's mm -hmm. middle class. Mm -hmm. We have one class, I shouldn't say classless. And of course that's nonsense. Yeah. Uh, Increasingly, uh, it's becoming obvious to greater numbers of people, I oh. think. Exactly. Barbara Ehrenreich wrote the book Fear of Falling. It was a lot of people in the middle class are fear of falling into the lower class. Right. And many, many people are being put in that position while all the aspirations are to try right. and get into the upper reaches of the middle class, as it were, or to, you know, and they, right. Yeah, right. that upwardly mobile. So you see, it, and, and I think we, uh, we, it's very hard to get Americans to talk about 
issues of class, uh, ex except for you know a few uh, left-wing intellectuals like Barbara Ehrenreich. Uh, and I think that, uh, and I find one of the curious things to me is how uh, people in the apex of our political and economic structure are apparently fearful of oh, increasingly. Uh, of what some call class warfare. Oh yeah, increasingly uh, I think it is, because if, if I may, I, th I think it is because if we just allow the situation to go and you've got a situation that is, uh, the, 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 the concentration of the ownership is becoming ever more constant, it's becoming global, I mean they can go global to avoid the, the labor unions have been undercut, right. uh, they have no power and the, the, the situation is becoming more and more unequitable, in the, it, it, it's building. We begin to have uh, militia movements. We begin to have uh, ter terrorist movements. We begin to have, you know, a sense of there being a reaction in, in violent ways against the system and so forth. Maybe they're irrational and so forth. But uh, it happened uh, to Louis, the Louis Cators in 16, you know, and others are aware of the fact that uh -huh. at a certain point, the people begin to uh, move in what not like seem like uh, rational ways, but when their back is against the wall and enough people feel that way, they might be able to. They might be able to move in a serious way against them, and they're targeting uh, increasingly the corporations. And the corporations do not have, or those who would represent them, do not have, seemingly, a rationale that allows for there to be a sense of equity and ethics introduced into the this capitalist system. That that would make it possible for them, even if they wanted to, in a certain sense, to co-opt that. Development, if, if that's what they wanted, by 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 relating the mass of the people to uh, to the economic system, the way in which it is developed. I mean, it is it is actually producing goods and services, which is increasingly robotized, technological, and the people are being marginalized as part of a productive process. Right. And I mean, there has to be a large sociological change. They could adopt that process as well, <coughs> but the people who are critical of the system, who are outside the system haven't come with a critique other than let's either eliminate them, which may or may, I mean, that's a, a pattern that would be difficult, uh, you know, in some sort of a revolution, and to have some government takeover or something in a, in a system that seems not to have worked, or uh, they, they, but they, they seem not to be able to come to the pattern that you have to relate people to the way that is, it's a, a revolutionary thing in a, an appropriate pattern to relate people to the way in which the, th the goods and services are actually being produced, but they've had a traditional stake in valuing labor because that's the only way people had to get money in order to get their standards mm -hmm. up. So they're caught in a kind of fix and they are blinkered on their side, intellectuals are. So mm -hmm. they don't bring an effective critique to those who are running the show. Mm -hmm. you know? it, that's of course true. Uh, but, uh, I think two, two, two uh, important uh, points that grow out of the kind of work that we we've been doing. Uh, I'm one of the founders, and I was the first uh, chair of, uh, of something called the, the Other Economic Summit, okay. TOES, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, was initiated in the early 1980s uh, in an effort to provide a, a parallel forum, uh, sort of a people's forum, to the annual economic summits that the seven leading industrialized countries uh, hold usually in each uh, June or July. Uh, the <coughs> and the next one is going to be in Denver mm -hmm. next, uh, next June. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the major purposes or goals of, of TOES is, is to provide indeed a forum where uh, alternative ideas, alternative arrangements that are actually working on the ground all right. Yeah, all right. can uh, be given some visibility. Good. Uh, and, and one of the things that's striking to me, and it, it's surfacing again, this happens every seven years because they rotate the, the location of their summit yes. among the seven uh, participating uh, countries. Mm -hmm. So the last one we had in, in the United States was uh, in Houston in 1990. Uh, and uh, it's already apparent to me in the preparations for the one in June that there's even more vitality in this alternative world. Uh, and it's largely unrecognized by the mainstream media. Okay. Uh, which yeah. probably is just as well uh, because... Benign uh, neglect. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh-huh. 
The other thing I want to say is regards uh, the, the corporation, uh, and I've been particularly active uh, in, in an effort, which is still in the very early stages, uh, to create a movement. We haven't done it yet. I mean, we're still talking about the contours and the issues and, and uh, <coughs> uh, what kinds of strategies are likely to work and not work. But through the program on corporations, law, and democracy, we are trying to stimulate a series of what Bill Greider calls democratic conversations okay. among people in all shapes, sizes, descriptions, uh, to get them to rethink both the nature of democracy mm -hmm. and the role of a corporation in it. Okay, yeah, right. Uh, and to, through that, to come to an understanding uh, which people must acquire, must do for themselves. It has to be actual, self-actualized. It can't be, it's nothing that you can instruct them in. Uh, they have to, to sort this out in their own way and devise their own ideas about what kind of a society it is they want to live in. All right. That's the larger issue and that's yes, the central is. issue. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and once that is, once we've begun to build some consensus around that, mm -hmm. Uh, then we're at, at a stage where we can begin to address seriously the question of, of what are the alternatives to a society that is increasingly dominated by large corporations. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's very important to understand that that is the reality, that the Fortune 500 uh, corporations in the last 15 years have more than doubled their assets while, by the way, shedding one-third of their workforce. Yeah, right. Uh, so they're, they're becoming increasingly irrelevant in meeting uh, widespread human needs in, in, in our society and around the world. And that's the great struggle for the balance of this century, what's left of it, and probably well into the next. Yeah. It'll be it, a long, long struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have no illusions about this. Yeah. Uh, we have to start thinking in terms of blocks of time, like 25 or 50 years. Yeah, that would be very good if we could uh, And I, I, my favorite uh, analogy of that is uh, the struggle to overcome the doctrine of separate but equal, mm -hmm. uh, which was enshrined in a Supreme Court decision in 1896, mm -hmm. Plessy versus Ferguson. In the early 1930s, a young group of predominantly black lawyers got together and laid out a strategy for overcoming that doctrine. Mm -hmm. It took them 25 years to do it. Mm -hmm. In 1954, in the Brown versus the right, Board of Education, right. that doctrine was finally reversed. Yeah. So they had a plan, they had a strategy. It wasn't a straight line, it mm -hmm. went this way and that, but nonetheless, they eventually uh, got, to, got to their goal. Right. And that's the kind of thinking we're trying to encourage right. around this issue of corporations and democracy. Right. And, and to do it through a process that encourages participatory democracy and self-discovery and right. allow it to come out of it that there is a recognition yes, of these yes. changes. And that's, that's really very needed because we are living in times that are incredibly fast-paced and th changes are coming and uh, it's important that there be a responsible approach to understanding these things other than the traditional approaches. And if I may, your work over the years, well. so individually and with the Consul, has aided in that direction. I thank you very, very much for that. And I thank you very much for coming in and talking. Unfortunately, even in cable where we have more time, we run out of time. We run out of time for this segment. But I thank you very much for coming well, in and for all your work. It's a pleasure to be here. And it has been your pleasure, the Nether Perceptions Inn, of uh, the uh, Award Morehouse. He's the president of the Council on International and Public Affairs, important organization here in New York City. They are in the book, and they could uh, be in touch with him and uh, raising issues that are of great importance. I'm happy to have been able to bring those to you. And we on Conversations invite you to tune in. We'll be coming back again next week, same time. But once again, Mr. Morehouse Award, if I may, thank you very, very much for all your work and for participating in the program. Uh, my pleasure. Until next time. We covered some of the ground. Some? Uh, yeah, we got at it. We got at it. Uh, uh -huh. uh, where are these? Uh, what's the, the venue? Uh, venue for Just in December. Manhattan. It'll be carried in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And uh, it'll be probably next week, mm -hmm. I think, probably, or the week after that it'll carry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a cut, right? A wrap? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I get this. You gotta go.